We're in a several week series talking about family. We started last week by talking about the importance of mothers and families and how we raise kids, and I want to continue with that this week, again, because our kids need us. And I can't think of a time in American history anymore where kids need the support and love, encouragement and instruction of Christian parents more than they do now. Tammy was lamenting last week that she only has a couple marbles left. I knew she was losing her marbles. A couple marbles left with her son, Noah, and then he'll be going off to college. And uh, I know that I have 52 marbles left with my son. As we sent Hannah off to Guatemala last Wednesday, you have a lot of different things that run through your mind. Have we trained her for this? Is she ready for this? Will she be wise? And uh, it, will she trust the Lord? And, and we certainly have to do that. And so many of you have experienced, and some of you will experience in this coming week, the graduation of your child, them stepping off to the new part of life. You grandparents will be going through the same emotions as the parents, and uh, many of us who love and invest in kids will be feeling the same feelings. And so today... I just want to just pause and think, how many of you would like to raise kids or help to raise kids that are champions? Go ahead, raise your hand. Champions. It's a great feeling to win a championship, isn't it, Adam? And when you work with your boys, Adam's a great coach, and, and he works with those kids, and he's so diligent and so faithful to work with those kids. And when you're trying to raise somebody that's a champion in baseball, think about all the things that you do. You work hard on training them. You make sure that the instruction is correct. You love them, but you correct them. You, you work with them on their physical well-being. You make sure that they're eating right. You make sure they're getting the rest. You make sure that everything that they need as far as equipment and, and training and instruction is all there. Because you know if they're going to be a champion, it's not an easy path. You know that if they're going to be the best, then it's something that they're going to have to really work on. And I thank God for people like Adam and so many people in this congregation who pour into the lives of young people, whether it's as a teacher, whether it's as a coach, whether it's as a music instructor, so many, so many are doing that. And again, the thrill of being a champion, it sure beats, it sure beats losing. And so today, I want, I want to just challenge you on how we can raise our kids to be a champion at the most important thing in life, and that is life itself. You see, Paul tells us that we don't run our race, we don't fight our fight for a perishable crown. It's not for a trophy that's going to rust or a ribbon that's going to fade. We run this life for a crown that is imperishable. In other words, we run this life for eternal glory. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it awesome that in heaven, when you're a champion, every day through the rest of history is championship recognition day? Isn't it awesome that the things that we accomplish here on earth in the name of Christ never do fade? The glory is fresh and eternal, and the championship is celebrated every day for the rest of eternity. Friends, that is the kind of championship we ought to be raising our kids to earn and celebrate. The, the championship of life, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. Oh, I can think about the joy of standing there with the newscasters there and the video camera and the, and the guy with the microphone and introducing each one of those kids who were part of that championship team. What glory it was that it doesn't begin to compare with the glory that we will have forever in heaven. Isn't it amazing? There's a celebration in heaven when somebody gets saved. I love the old gospel song, and it made news in heaven when I got saved. And so, how awesome would it be to go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and have him place a victor's crown on your head? Today, will you open your Bibles with me to Genesis 33? Today, we look at a man who did it wrong, and then he did it right. A man who messed up with some of his kids, and a man who got it right with some others. And we're going to learn just four valuable lessons today Maybe you'll learn more than that, but I'm going to give you four valuable lessons from the life of Jacob and his journey in raising children. Genesis 33, verse 17 through 20. 
Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. And when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city, and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamar, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar, and he called it El Elohe Israel. Jacob, Abraham the father, Isaac his son. Isaac had two sons. Remember their names? Jacob and Esau. And you remember that Jacob was kind of a conniver at his mom's beckon, and he connived his brother, tricked him out of his inheritance. And so Jacob's kind of a shifty character, and he goes back and forth with the Lord, and the Lord does something in his life and shows him all kinds of grace, and Jacob now is trying to raise his own family, and by this point of the story in Genesis 33, he and his brother have reconciled. He's also reconciled with his father-in-law, so he lives at peace. He's not worried anymore about being attacked by his brother, and so he's just now ready to go on with his life to raise his children and to, to lead his family. Esau returns to Seir, and Jacob travels about five miles downstream toward the Jordan River to a place called Sukkoth, which means booths. He builds him a house, and he builds booths for his cattle. It was a well-watered region, magnificent highland site on the eastern side of the Jordan and just north of Jabbok. It's of interest that Jacob stops and settles here because the Lord had told him to leave Haran and return to the land of Canaan back to Bethel. By the way, Bethel means house of God, where God had first appeared to him. Sukkoth, my friends, where he stopped, is not Canaan and is not Bethel. He's on the wrong side of the river. Have you ever heard the expression, the wrong side of the tracks? Well, there weren't tracks in that day. He was on the wrong side of the river. And he remains there apparently for several years, maybe two or three. In time, he moves again. He crosses the river and actually enters into the land of Canaan. He travels to the vicinity of Shechem, where Abraham had paused on his first journey into the land of Canaan. Shechem was 45 miles north of Jerusalem in the valley between Mount Ebal and the Mount, valley of, and the Mount Gerizim. Once there, he settled into a town called Shalem, which means peace. Bought a parcel of ground, establishing claim to property in Canaan. Now he's in Canaan, closer to Hebron and Bethel. However, he is not where the Lord told him to go. Would you say that with me? He is not where the Lord told him to go. How many Christians do we know that are not where the Lord told them to go? They are compromised. They are in partial obedience, which means they are in total disobedience. And so he buys property. He has not totally forgotten the Lord because we see that he builds an altar and names it El Elohe Israel, which means the mighty God of Israel. Maybe he's remembering his deliverance from Laban, his father-in-law, and Esau. He settles down to raise a family in the region of Shechem. Again, a beautiful place, well-watered, fertile land. Maybe that's what attracted him to stop and put down roots. No doubt, it seemed to be the perfect place for his livestock as well as his family. And years pass without incident. But as we enter chapter 34, we get a sense that Jacob and his family were well-received by the Canaanite neighbors. They were even comfortable with them. His children grew up before them. Verse 1 says, in, verse, in chapter 34, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. You see, his neighbors were Hivites, very populous tribe, descendants of Ham through his son Canaan. And here is evidence that Jacob and his children were building relationships with their neighbors in Canaan. Now, by the way, these Hivites were not Jews. They did not worship the God of the Jews. They had a strange religion that was based upon sensuality and sexuality. And so we see Jacob soon to learn that his decision to live here was not a good decision. You see, he soon learned the danger of raising kids in Canaan. His daughter, 
Dinah, born to Leah, was visiting a friend in the nearby city of Shechem. Dinah was about 15 to 17 years old, perhaps, in the flower of her youth, still innocent, growing into womanhood, naive, foolish, and perhaps immature. Shechem, the young prince, the son of a prominent family, fell in love with her. Really, it's not the kind of love that you want. In other words, he lusted after her. His heart was burning within him for her. We don't know how long the relationship existed, but we do know in verse 2 that it says he saw her, which means that he looked at her, perhaps he gazed at her intently, and then it says he took her. The Hebrew word means he took her by force to capture. And then it said he lay with her, he imposed his will on her. In other words, he raped her and defiled her and dishonored her. I can't think of anything worse as a father. I can't imagine how it would feel to find this out. You parents today know exactly what I'm talking about. Whenever you hear of a little girl taken by a strange uncle, hiding out in parts of the woods, and you think of the possibilities, it turns your stomach, and it should. Aren't you glad today for people who still have their stomachs turned and are willing to travel out on their property with a four-wheeler to see if that little girl might be there? Today, we see that we live in a dangerous world. Jacob had settled down in a dangerous world, and the danger finally caught up with him. This was not a rape and run case. Verse 3 tells us that Shechem cleaved to her, began to speak to Dinah from his heart in an effort to console, console her and express his affection. He involved his father, sought his help to intervene and intercede for him, to control the damage, and perhaps to seek permission for Dinah, uh, from Dinah's father for him to marry her. And in time, the word came to Jacob, and, and amazingly, he stayed silent about this. Verse 5 through 8, Jacob heard that, that ha he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with the cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel and lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing he... He ought not to have done. You can imagine these boys were deeply distressed by what had happened to their sister. They were angry, and they had a right to be angry. And so Jacob works out a deal with Shechem's father. And he says, you can marry, you, your son can marry my daughter. But, but the boys said, but dad, make sure that all those boys, and including the father, are all circumcised. It was a large family. And they agreed to it. And so all the men were circumcised. And after they had been circumcised, Jacob's son, unbeknownst to Jacob, go in when those men were incapacitated, and they kill every one of them. Now rape has turned to mass murder. Jacob scared for his life, afraid that there'll be retaliation, afraid for his family. And you can imagine now what kind of mess this is. And friends, how could he have ever known that settling down in a place that seemed so peaceful, to be with neighbors that seemed so okay, would have led to this kind of destruction and danger. And so eventually we see that he has to pack up his family and finally go to where God told him to go in the first place. And that is back to Bethel. Now, it's amazing and it's interesting if you think about this. He raised a certain amount of boys there in that land of Shechem. And when you start to name off the tribes, you start to see familiar names. But later on, he had boys who were not raised there. And one of the great heroes, one of my great heroes of the Bible, was Jacob's son, Joseph who was not raised in Shechem. The boys who were raised there sold their brother into captivity. Their brother was able to move on, and even in the face of total unrighteousness, the story of Jacob shows that he was, I mean, Joseph shows that he was faithful, faithful through all kinds of problems. And so we learn some extremely important lessons. We're reminded today that we live in Canaan ourselves. 
Do you know that? If you don't know that, just turn on the news. Read the newspaper. Go online and start to look at what's going on in our nation. It's amazing the confusion that's out there. 51% divorce rate, latchkey kids. Unbelievable, unbelievable the commercials that come on our TV shows. Unbelievable the access to all kinds of things that are rotten on the internet. The music that our children have access to is repulsive. The conversations that our kids have with one another is sickening. 26% of underage kids partake of alcohol. 40% have tried marijuana. There used to be a pregnant club in Rhode Island where girls would go out and try to get pregnant with the popular guys of the school. Oral sex is a craze amongst our children. Our teens are porn addicted. And even things like Cartoon Network and Disney promote things that are counter to the biblical standard. Disrespect is rampant. Adversity to Christianity is constantly on the rise. What was the problem? Where did Jacob fail as a father in allowing the deadly influence of Canaan to devastate his home? First, we see this. Jacob's family fell apart in Canaan because of carnality. Will you say that word with me? Carnality. Jacob found a place that was good to raise cattle. That means he gets to eat steak. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Steak. Woo. And so it was a beautiful land. There was plenty of water. He had peace, which we all want peace, don't we? And so rather than raise a stink, rather than to go the extra trouble, he just raised his kids to enjoy the fruit of the land. And in that, he forgot about God. Boy, we are in that kind of danger. We live in houses that our parents would have only dreamed of. We drive cars that have every kind of push-button thing. They, they, they can park for us, heaven's sake. Now, the 2002 Le Sabre won't do that. But still, you press a button and the air conditioning comes on. How many of you remember the old-fashioned air conditioning, 260? Roll the windows down and go 60 miles an hour. I can remember the first new car I ever bought. Famous words. I don't need air conditioning. The next summer, I worked at Disney World. The summer after that, it was over 100 degrees, two weeks in a row. I don't need air conditioning. Boy, I like it now. Even if I have to kick under the dash to get it to come on, it still comes on. We live with all kinds of great food. How about that? Just think about all the food that's available. Walk into that new place called Fresh Market and just ask yourself, are we living in a land flowing with milk and honey? And we desire to get along with our neighbors. We don't want to have fights with people who think differently. So we'll, we'll zip our lip. We'll kind of put God back here and we'll tolerate things that God doesn't tolerate. Because we, after all, want peace, don't we? And so because the Christians want peace, they'll bite their lip and they'll let their kids go on and run and play in a world that's dangerous. Jacob raised his kids to be carnal. And I wonder how many of us are doing the same thing. Yeah, a little, a little altar to God over here. A, li a little reminder once in a while where we came from. A little, a little bit here and there just to keep God off our case. But really, we live for the joys of this world. When Jacob raised his kids to be carnal, he shouldn't be surprised that they ended up being carnal. He shouldn't be surprised that they were victims of those who were carnal. He pitched his tent, verse 18 says, before the city. Lot had pitched his tent before Sodom. We have talked about that before. And by doing so, Peter says, vexed himself and his family with filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot eventually lost his family, and here we see Jacob following the same pattern. Parents, you can't live like the culture and give it your tacit approval. Cuss like a sailor, drink like a fish, blend in with every Joe, Sally, and Harry, and expect your kids to do what you say. If we are surrounded by Canaanites, if we fill our home with Canaanite thinking, our kids will be Canaanites. And the Bible tells us, better would it be for a millstone to be hung around our necks and thrown into the sea than to cause a little one to stumble. And so rule number one, if you want to raise a champion, be spiritual. 
Would you say that with me? If you want to be a champion, be spiritual. We have to constantly remind our kids we do not live for the pleasures of this earth. These things are fleeting. This life is like a vapor. We are longing our eyes to that which will be. We are looking beyond this place to the eternal place. We are not living for the satisfactions of this life, but for eternal satisfaction in a land truly flowing with milk and honey. The land where there's no more sorrow, sickness, pain, death, no more tears. We are not looking for the approval of men, but we are looking for the approval of God. You see, when we think spiritually, we love holiness. I don't say this to boast, but if I take my daughter down 2nd Avenue here in Nashville, where all the bars are and the honky-tonks, and it doesn't matter that we're going to a restaurant down there that we like, if she cannot stand to walk down that street, it literally makes her nauseated. Why? Because she has such a sense of holiness that she's totally uncomfortable in that place. Hallelujah! Because I do not worry about her going off to college and hanging out at the bars. Why? Because in her heart there's a sense of holiness. When my kids run around with their friends, and some of them are right here today, I don't worry about them getting into trouble. I don't worry. They're, they're not perfect. Look at Noah right here, for example. But I don't worry about it because they have a sense of righteousness. And you know what? They police each other. They spur each other on to good works. How that was one of our, that was one of our memory verses. We don't worry about financial fruit. When your daughter says, I want to be a missionary, you think, well, enjoy being poor the rest of your life. And you know what? That's okay, because it's better to be financially poor and to be spiritually rich. And we don't look for physical fruit. We look for spiritual fruit. We say, God's given you spiritual gifts for spiritual fruit. And we start to look for that in life, not the size of your car or the type of house you have. We don't look for the type of vacations that you have. We look for the satisfaction of knowing that we've poured our lives out to bring spiritual fruit into this world. i got to tell you, I, it's hard for me to say it without tearing up. But when your little girl calls you and says, Dad, we led several children to Christ the first two days here, I can say, Hallelujah! Because that's far more important than a big house or a fancy car. We teach our children the value of spiritual fruit, not financial fruit. And we, we have them to pour their lives out in spiritual service to God and to their fellow man rather than serving their own selfish in selfishness. Second thing we see, Jacob's family fell apart in Canaan because of hypocrisy. Jacob builds an altar here, but later we learn that he allowed his idols in his home. In Genesis 35, Jacob decides it's time to head for Bethel to a right relationship with God. But before he does, he tells his family in verse 2b, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Think about it. Jacob was claiming allegiance to God who forbids idols, and at the same time, he was allowing them in his home. Before he could get back to a right relationship with the Lord, he had to put away some of the strange things in his life, in his family, and in his home. Some years ago, there was a gospel tract that asked a question, what if Jesus came to your house today, what would he find? What would you need to change? What would you need to put away? What channels would you need to block on your TV? What history would you need to clear on your internet? Let me ask you a question today. What are you allowing into your home that brings defilement? What are you allowing into your life that when you say, let's go to church, it's one thing, but then your kids see what you watch on TV, that's another thing. They hear you speak the words of God and sing on a Sunday morning, and they hear you cuss like a sailor on a Saturday night. You can't live a life of hypocrisy and expect your children to grow up the way they should. They will always, listen to me, they will always choose the path of least resistance, and champions don't do that. You want to raise kids that are champions, you set the right example. Adam, I'm remembering a commercial that was on TV a couple years ago about a guy gets a ball and glove, he's going to go out and he's going to throw with his kid, and when he gets out there, his kid throws like a T-Rex. I mean, it was pitiful. And then the ball goes back to the father, and the father's throwing like a T-Rex. And neither one of them can throw, neither one of them can catch. I mean, if you're going to teach your kid to throw, you probably better learn how to throw. point is, if you're going to teach your kid to be a champion for the Lord, then you probably better be a champion yourself. 
It's time to study the Word of God and make sure you're doing it right. Adam, I've watched video after video making sure that I was teaching Ken how to throw and hit the right way. I never caught a day in my life, but I watched video after video, read article after article, sent him to camps to make sure that he knew how to catch because I want him to be a champion. But I'm going to tell you far more than that. I want him to be a spiritual champion. And so I want to make sure I know the word of God. I want to make sure I don't live in a way that's compromised so that he doesn't choose the wrong path. Jacob lost his children. They were a mess. And the reason they were a mess is because he was a mess. These boys had some values. They had some absolutes. They were up in an uproar, they were upset, they were enraged by what had happened, and yet, in their compromised, hip hypocritical life, they took a rape and turned it into murder. We must be examples for our children, not object lessons. So number two, if you want to raise a champion, be consistent. Will you say that with me? If you want to raise a champion, be consistent. I had a person lament to me just a couple weeks ago, their 18-year-old daughter off to college, never drank in high school and so forth, and here she was, she was out drinking, and, and he was sick about it. And we don't sit here and we don't condemn because we're not legalists and there's nothing wrong with having a drink with your meal or whatever. But I will tell you this, if you drink in front of your kids and say this is the adult thing to do when they turn 18 and they want to be an adult, that's exactly what they'll do. And you know what? I just read an article in the paper yesterday about a baseball player in Atlanta who's finally made the big leagues after 51 months in prison. And the article said, I hate myself when I drink. We never know if that could be us. And we certainly never know if it could be our children. When I went off to college, it wasn't a question of whether I drink or not. It was not a question. I just never did it. I'm going to tell you today, I could be an alcoholic. I could have the potential to be violent. I don't know if I do or not because I stayed away from that. We take the higher road. We make sure that we're not being hypocrites. If you want to raise a champion, be consistent, amen? Third, Jacob's family fell apart in Canaan because of laxity. As we read the first verse of Genesis 34, we get a sense that Dinah was used to going into town. It says, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Either Jacob had rules against this kind of thing, or it was all right with him that his daughter spends time in Shechem and develops relationships with these people. She had friends there. If Jacob had rules for his children, then it appears that there were no consequences for breaking those rules. This is what happens over time when our children become exposed to wickedness, the immorality of the world. Over time, we become callous to it, and soon it no longer shocks us. Isn't it amazing, by the way? The things that we see on TV now, that if we would have seen it 20 years ago, we would have thrown a brick through the TV. Isn't it amazing the things that we see now in our youth, that if it would have happened in the 50s or the 70s or even the 80s, it would have been a tremendous outroar. No longer do things disturb us. No longer do things, do, do things affect us. We have loosened our standards. We no longer place barriers and, and, and boundaries between our children and the world. There are less absolutes in our lives, less black, less white, and more gray, more debatable things. It's being debated right now for crying out loud. Which bathroom do we use? We in a confused world. And we don't go out there and lash out and hate. We love people who are confused, amen? And we're here for them. But listen, friends, when you embrace the culture, you have to let go of God. Because you can't love righteousness and sin at the same time. Jacob was lax. James Dobson says, sometimes we are so concerned about giving our children what we never had growing up, we neglect to give them what we did have growing up. And that is this, children need a moral compass. Teach your children biblical value. They will learn some sort of values. Tell them why and what to expect. So third, if you want to raise a champion, be diligent. Say that with me. Be diligent. <laughs> we protect our kids. Pitch counts. Don't throw more than this. We make sure they have the right equipment. We're constantly making sure they have the training they need. We're overwatching them. We go to all the games. We travel on the weekends. We're out there with them making sure they're doing everything right. We're so diligent to train champions in baseball or, or in music 
or in spelling bees? Shouldn't we give them that same kind of diligence in training them to be people of God? Listen, if you give your kid a cell phone at age 10 with unfettered access to the internet, don't be surprised when they fish things up that are vulgar and gross. When you give your children unfettered access to the TV or video games, or unfettered access to any kind of friend they want to have, don't be surprised when they choose the wrong friends. Being a parent, being a grandparent, being somebody who helps raise children is a hard job. It requires diligence. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want a champion, you're going to be diligent. And you're going to make sure you protect them. My son is now 17 years old. I guess he could go to whatever movie he wants, but he's not going to. As long as he lives under my roof, we're going to be diligent doesn't mean that we're making him naive. It means that we're helping him to be holy. Fourth, Jacob's family fell apart in Canaan because of passivity. Will you say that with me? Passivity. Passivity means to be inactive, unmotivated, and unmoved. A passive parent is one that is on his or her heels, uninvolved in the lives of children. A passive parent is one who tries to be a child's friend over being a parent. The priest Eli was passive with his sons. He did not act when he heard of their shameful deeds. David was passive with his children, especially Absalom. On one occasion, Absalom resorted to violence in an effort to gain his father's attention. In both instances, the results were devastating. Jacob is passive in his prevention. Here is evidence that Jacob is not the spiritual leader of his home that he ought to be. He is not proactive. He does not provide alternatives to worldly activities and relationships. He's not like his grandfather Abraham, of whom God said in Genesis 18, 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and that he, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken to him. Passive parenting is careless parenting. Learn what your children are watching. Learn what they're reading. Learn what they're saying. Look Look, look at what they're looking at on the net. Talk to them. Help your kids foster relationships with others who have their same values. Steer them away from the danger of this world into healthy relationships and activities. The decision to intermarry with the Canaanites is not the will of God. This was not a racial thing. It was a religious thing. The Jews were separatists because God intended them to be that way, to be in the world but not of the world. It was their uniqueness and holiness that kept them pure from assimilating into the world. So number four, if you want to raise a champion, be proactive. The key word in there is active, not reactive. Not, oh my God, what have I done? But thinking ahead, planning the path, protecting our children. Years ago, Sheriff's Office in Texas City distributed a list of rules titled How to Raise a Juvenile Delinquent in Your Own Family. How many of you would like to have that pamphlet? Here it is. Rule one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. This will ensure his believing that the world owes him a living. And so overstimulate a child. Give him what he wants. It's much easier than giving him what he needs. Next time he cries, just give him whatever he wants. No love, time, correction, patience, understanding, and instruction is what a child needs. Rule two, if you want to raise a heathen, Pick up everything he leaves lying around. This will teach him that he can throw off responsibility to others. Rule three, always take his side in any conflict, whether it be a neighbor, teacher, or policeman. Believe that they are all prejudiced against your sweet, innocent child. Listen to me. I'm a teacher too, and your child is not sweet. Your child is not innocent, and I am not out for your child. Remember that your kids are fallen. Get the whole story and don't be afraid to be disappointed in your kid's behavior because that means that you can correct it before it's too late. Follow these three simple rules and prepare yourself for a life of grief like Jacob had. A little poem says this, Some children walk the high road while others tread the low. A parent's life determines which way a child will go. As parents raising kids in Canaan, we must not wait for the wake-up call. Now is the time to learn to do better than Jacob. And so let me just summarize one more time. As parents, we must be spiritual in the lives of our children. As parents, we realize that we are not enough. We need the Lord on our side. We must keep our hearts in tune with his will, in line with his word, and empowered by his spirit. As parents, we must be consistent in the lives of our children. 
We cannot say one thing and do another. Our children must see consistency in what we say and do. As parents, we must be diligent in the lives of our children. Our children do not need another friend. They need a parent, someone who will love them enough to say the things that they do not desire to hear, to make the, them do the things they do not want to do. They need someone to protect them. They need our judgment, our decisions that are based upon the truth of God's holy word. And finally, as parents, we must be proactive in the lives of our children. Parents must be ahead of their children, on their toes, and not on their heels. Golly, I look around this church and I see some champions. When I hear that Brogan was student of the month, I say, yes! When I look at Aaron Boland's kids, I say, yes! When I look at Ashley, I say, how'd she ever do it with a father like that? I get to see Savannah Vedito almost every day. And I look at her and I say, yes. I see our college students. I see their faithfulness. And I say, yes. I see Tori up here playing the bass. And I say, yes. I, so many of you are doing a good job. Bruce, you can raise a champion. He can be a champion. But you can't do it like Jacob. Grandparents, you can help raise champions, amen? I'm telling you, you can't underestimate the power of your influence in your grandkid's life. Give them a new baseball bat and give them a new Bible. Help them to be champions eternally. Keith in Tennessee, you have more kids than you know, and you can help us raise them to be champions. You have no idea how much influence that you have. Spiritual children all over the place. And those are the best kind because you can send them home. <laughs> I know this is kind of heavy. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think there's anything more important in this life outside of our own faith in Jesus Christ than to make sure that we're passing that on. One of the saddest statements in Scripture it's found over and over again in the book of Judges that there arose a generation that neither knew the Lord nor the works that he had done in Israel. And that's because some generation didn't teach their kids how to be champions. It's not too late. Remember, Jacob moved. He got it right, got rid of the idols, moved to Bethel, and he raised one of the finest young men the world has ever known, Joseph, who, as I can see, never sinned. I mean, he did, but we don't have a record of it. And he saved the entire nation of Egypt and the entire nation of Israel. You can do that. And so let me just challenge you. Is Andy Griffith here? <laughs> I think that's Opie Taylor. Race champions in your life. Would you join me? Put a hand on a kid around you or a young person. Just go ahead. Kids, don't be freaked out right here. We're not going to hurt you. Right up here is a bunch of kids. I need some folks to come up here. Come on. Come up here. Put some hands on kids. Don't be shy. Come on. We'll be here all day if you don't do what I'm asking you to do. Pray with me. Father, our hearts are grieved by the world that we live in. Yeah, we, we want to show love. We want to accept people, but too often that leads us to accepting Canaanite culture. Allowing our kids to be a part and even bringing it into our home. And we know all that will bring is destruction. Yeah, there might be peace for a while, but in the end, it's going to bring destruction. Your word reminds us there's pleasure in sin for a season, but its end is destruction. Help us to be wise in raising these kids and help us to raise them to be champions for the cause of Christ. Help us to lead them with righteous examples. Help us to teach them a love for the things of the Spirit. 
Help us to not be hypocrites in our lives, not compromising. Father, help us to be proactive in protecting them from the things that surround them. Father, help us to teach them to be strangers and aliens in a land, knowing that they are sojourners. This is not their home. They're headed for a better place. And Father God, we pray that from this church, these boys and girls would grow up to be righteous men and women who make a tremendous impact on the kingdom of God. Father, we pray that we would do all that we can to be an example, to be an encouragement, to be a strength, to be a protector. And so, God, we give them to you. We dedicate them to you. We pray, Father God, they would be wise, that you would watch over them and protect them from the confusion that surrounds them. Forgive us where we failed. Help us to lay aside those things that have defiled our homes and to move forward to the house of God, to the place where you want us to be. We pray, Father God, that many children would come to know Jesus Christ through the work of this church and others. Even right now, as children in Guatemala are hearing about Jesus Christ, may it change their culture. Now, Father, we pray that you'd lead us and guide us and bless us as we go to our community groups. Help us to build friendships, relationships, and to grow in the knowledge of the truth so that we may raise our kids, not in Canaan, but in the house of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.